Well, hello people. Uh, it's me again. Uh, I'll come with part three really. You can call this part three. Dealing with our family DNA roots. Uh, based from the um, DNA results that I got back from uh, the uh, results finder. Um, it's coming from the uh, genetics table that I put together based on this and the spread that um, I gave the percentages between um my maternal side and my paternal side the x and the y chromosomes um so in this video i wanted to put together a bit of a i wanted to draw a bit of a speculative picture of how um these percentages what we were uh, placed into this uh genetic grouping table um, actually spread down uh, to my generation. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to uh, play for you um, some audio. Uh, it's um, from something that I actually written based on my own, like I say, findings based on uh, my uh, genetic roots my dna roots uh but it's um spoken by a female voice um so if you can look past that really okay so um this is my dna family roots The DNA results that came back from my previously provided sample, when combined with old family stories and recorded events of the past, have helped to paint a speculative picture of my personal family history. The table shows how the four genetic groups identified in my DNA breaks down, with estimated values inputted demonstrating how these different elements spread across the two sides of my family. The X column in the table represents what is estimated to be the percentage spread for the maternal side of my family and the Y column for my paternal side, showing that my mother's side has more DNA blood diversity with her Kenyan and Baltic Jew elements coming into play. The Nigerian genetic group is the largest in my DNA makeup being almost three times as great as all the other genetic groups put together. It is basically made up from three ancient West African nations in the Lower Guinea, the Akan from present-day Eastern Ghana and Togo, LG, and the Ibo and Yoruba nations, both in modern-day southern Nigeria, LG2. The Creole genetic group is a diverse segment made up of Taino who are the Aboriginal people of the island and European, a variety mix of Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, British and Irish peoples, sometimes with additional African, non-Lower Guinea, elements, traces of which may be found in modern-day Sierra Leone because of historic migration by Maroons, free blacks and former slaves, to that part of Africa around the start of the 19th century, as well as European presence along the Upper Guinea coast, stretching back to the transatlantic slave era, bringing about a mulatto-like clan of people separate to the indigenous Afrikaans in the territory. The Kenyan genetic group is from the Buganda people located along the north coast of the Great Lake of Central Africa, around the modern-day Kenya-Uganda border. An area targeted by slave raiders to the north and east of the region over several centuries. The Baltic Jew genetic group comes through a heritage line that is Lithuanian Baltic, containing additional trace elements of historic ancestry stretching back into Turkey and Greece in the time of Byzantine Rome when a significant Jewish underclass from North Africa still existed within that territory, before the start of the slow migration of their culture and religion northwards into Central Europe and beyond. What follows is a theoretical look at how my family history was developed stretching back to the late 18th century when my four times great-grandparents are estimated to have been born, as can be seen in the multi-generational table 
the maternal side, X. The one single ancestor easiest to pick out by looking at the multi-generational table is the Baltic Jew who measures at 1.6%, a level suggesting that he is one of my 32 four times great-grandfathers. There are very few circumstances that would have brought somebody of Baltic ancestry to the Caribbean island of Jamaica around the end of the 18th century. The most likely scenario is that this Baltic was from the Jewish community and was involved with merchant shipping, which may also have involved some acts of piracy. There was a significant minority Jewish community in Jamaica during the slave era, who hailed from various European countries including Spain, Portugal, Holland, and Poland, with the most radical amongst them engaging unashamedly in pirate activity against the Spanish. Their opposition to Spain being in relation to the Inquisition that was in place, forcing Spanish Jews to convert to the Christian faith and causing many to practice their true religion in secret or to relocate into neighboring countries. The designation of Poland in these times would have also covered Lithuania as well, raising the possibility that my Baltic Jew four times great-grandfather may have also been born in Jamaica, his family possibly even managing to maintain their Baltic bloodline over a few generations on the island. That Baltic line would come to a stop at this point when this ancestor has some kind of relationship with a Jamaican woman. The fact that his great-granddaughter, my great-grandmother, was said to be a woman with a light-skinned complexion demonstrates that a white to light-skinned complexion was maintained in the generations that immediately followed the Baltic Jew. The only direction left to turn to, given this scenario, is to the Creole part of my heritage, who are a people generally of mixed heritage in varying ways, some amongst them even appearing to be almost white in complexion. This would not have been an unusual occurrence in Jamaica at this time as the people of a lighter skin complexion would often only enter relationships with people of a similar skin tone or lighter, regardless of their family background, bringing about a recognizable and unique style of DNA branding. This would mean that of the four great-grandmothers of my great-grandmother, two of them were Creole women. It seems that of these two Creole women, one of them had a great-grandfather who was a Kenyan, with a birth year estimated at around 1690. It is reasonable in line with recorded historic events to conclude that this Kenyan arrived in Jamaica from southern Africa, with Dutch pirates who were operating across the Caribbean Sea and had one of its numerous bases in the southwest of Jamaica at a place now known as Bluefields. The Dutch had during the mid-17th century set up a colony at the Cape of Good Hope in present-day South Africa where they had begun transporting people from the Kenyan region to use as slaves. The Kenyans from Boganda lived close to the Great Lake in Central Africa and many may have been skilled ship's men through their traditional practice of trading across the waters into the distant territories on the other side of the Great Lake. This may have been what convinced his Dutch companions to release him from his shackles and chains and take him along with them to the Caribbean where he would play his part in their pirate operations, eventually meeting his beautiful Taino Creole woman, around 1720. The second of the two Creole great-grandmothers of my great-grandmother became involved with another Kenyan who must have been working with the Dutch pirates in the Caribbean after being rescued from a Spanish slave ship towards the end of the 18th century. The remaining great-grandparents of my great-grandmother were all born and living their life in their homeland region of Buganda, north of the Great Lake in present-day Uganda. It is their children born around 1810, who would be amongst those captured by the slave raiders from the eastern coastal territories, for transporting across the seas to be sold on the slave markets of Brazil and America. Fortunately for these captured Africans, they were able to escape such a fate, finding themselves turned over into the hands of Dutch privateers still operating in the Caribbean region, settling those rescued on various friendly Caribbean islands where they were assured that they wouldn't be forced into slavery. This theory can be backed by the fact that I have what could be called a confirmed double who happens to be of Dutch Caribbean heritage, suggesting a possible link through this Kenyan backstory. The immediate alternative to slavery thrust upon the Kenyans who arrived in Jamaica was the apprenticeship system, 
a limited term form of cheap labor used by the plantocracy to undercut the already underpaid former slaves who are still working for them. The children of my great-grandmother's two Creole great-grandmothers would be able to get together potentially supported by the mutual respect held between the Baltic Jew and the Kenyan privateer, both who had been involved with the pirate operations still taking place in the Caribbean region during the early 1800s. Together they would bring forward a near-white Creole boy child born around 1840 just after the time when slavery had been abolished in Jamaica. Amongst the small Kenyan community that had been settled in southwest Jamaica, a couple would get together bringing a girl child during the same period of time as the Creole boy, and these two children would eventually get together to become the parents of Sarah, the grandmother of my own mother, with an estimated birth date of around 1870 to 80. The table illustrates how all this is speculated to have come together. On my maternal grandmother's father's side of the family, these people are virtually untampered with Lower Guinea, Southern Nigeria, people with a prominence of dark skin in this stream, perhaps placing them amongst the last slaves to be legally, by British law, transported to Jamaica from Africa, arriving around the beginning of the 19th century. Alternatively, they may have been a multi-generational line of slaves, trying their best to keep their heads down and doing enough to ensure they escape the harshest of treatments against them from members of the slave-owning plantocracy. The table completes the maternal side of my mother's family and illustrates the untampered nature of my grandmother's paternal ancestral line going down to her father who was named Passable Wilson. As with my great-grandmother Sarah, Passable's estimated birth date is put at around 1870-80 in line with the settings of the multi-generational table, a segment of which is shown. From my mother's paternal side, it would be easiest to first look down the line of my grandfather's mother who is said to have claimed for herself and ultimately all of her offspring, marine heritage. Recent DNA findings suggesting a close blood link to Sierra Leone, a location from where few slaves, if any at all, arrived in Jamaica, proves that my great-grandmother's assertions were a thing of fact, as this African country was where the exiled marines of western Jamaica were eventually migrated to. This demonstrates a strong family link to the maroons of Kujo town and perhaps even direct descendancy from the great maroon warrior Kujo himself, who was also a sibling of the legendary Jamaican mother queen, Nanny, who was reputed to be a descendant of Akan royalty back in Africa. This idea of a direct connection to Kujo can be backed up when looking at the given name of my great-grandmother, Margaret Kumari, a name that is pronounced locally as Cumbri. It can perhaps be seen how the name could have become Kumari from Cumbri in the registration process which would probably have involved some poor quality handwriting that was not easy to read, if not changed for more sinister reasons. The significant thing about the name Cumbri is that it sounds very much like a Spanish-influenced version of the Akan name Cumber, a reference to the capital of the ancient Ghana Empire of about a thousand years previous, located in what is now present-day Mali. The name being a strong statement proclaiming a historic position of high status in association with the culture of that place. Prior to the decline of the ancient Ghana Empire a significant section of the royal family and their followers migrated south into the forest lands of what is now present-day Ghana to protect the secret locations of their gold mines from the ever-encroaching foreign traders from the north and east, who had their own underhand agendas of deception and exploitation. From these people, many of their descendants would fall victim to the slave-thirsty demands of the Europeans who had begun arriving on the southern coastline of their territory and carrying them away, across and beyond what was at that time called by European scholars the Ethiopian Ocean, Southern Atlantic, and into the Caribbean region. Taking all of this into consideration, the possibility of direct descendancy from Kujo the Maroon Warrior in my family, can be taken seriously and his estimated birth date of 1690 to his death in 1744 would tally with him being my sixth or seven times great-grandfather. 
It is, however, known that the Maroon people of Jamaica were not purely an Akan people, as in many if not most cases, they also had Taino heritage, making them at least partly a Creole people when defined within the layout of the various genetic groups that go together to form my own DNA reading. For this reason, all the ancestors of my great-grandmother Margaret going back to her great-grandparents and beyond have been defined as being Maroons who were part Lower Guinea, Akan, and part Creole, as shown in the table. This demonstrates that a significant number of the young people of the Kujo town community escaped being made exile from the island, taking refuge in the high, heavily wooded areas further inland and forming a small community out of the reach of the British authorities on the island. As they matured into full adulthood, a new generation of maroon bloods came into being, successfully managing to evade the attentions of the British authorities right through to the day of emancipation. These Maroons had little trust in the words of the British and their black-skinned agents, some being their own Maroon cousins, and would continue living their humble life in the woods for some time before gradually coming out into the open and interacting more with the wider community. My full-blooded Maroon great-grandmother's birth date, estimated in the table to be 1870, is in fact closer to 1880 or a few years after that date. On my maternal grandfather's paternal side, these people are very much of Lower Guinea, Southern Nigeria, heritage, which I presume to be of the Ibo tradition because of their marked enterprising nature, a characteristic said to be tied to that nation of people. There is also to go with this an additional small Creole element, depicted in the table as the part Creole couple amongst all of his great-grandparents, holding an estimated birth date of 1780. The British multi-generational system of slavery in Jamaica had directly affected this ancestral stream, and they had become skilled at making the most out of their sorry situation. The fact being that for the four times great-grandparents in this line, most if not all of them were born into slavery. It is possible that some of them were free blacks or favoured privileged so-called house slaves, but the greatest probability was that at least half of my maternal grandfather's great-grandparents in this stream were amongst the last generation of slaves in Jamaica before its full abolition in 1837. The first generation of children who were born around or after this date would become the parents of my great-grandfather, the only name I have for him being Mr. Daly. The paternal side, why? On my father's side of the family, the ancestral stream is a lot more of a typical makeup for a Jamaican family, in terms of possessing a majority Lower Guinea, Southern Nigeria, heritage in the Ibo tradition, the favoured choice of slave for the British plantocracy of Jamaica, with additional Creole-like elements, tending to be a varying mix of non-Lower Guinea people, whether Taino, European or African. Other than the fact that my father is estimated, as is demonstrated in the table, to be 80% Lower Guinea, Southern Nigeria, and 20% Creole, it is not so easy to build a picture of how his family makeup is put together. Because of this some of the findings in this section are a lot more speculative with certain aspects in need of greater clarity to give a more accurate picture. My father's maternal side is quite mysterious to me partly because my grandmother died within a few years of when my father emigrated to England in the 50s. But I did, however, meet her elderly twin sister during one visit to Jamaica, which shone some light on what would have been my paternal grandmother's DNA makeup. It was a special moment because, as I commented to one of my cousins who came with us to visit our great-aunt in Richmond, St. Mary, to me, she actually personifies more than just a picture of our grandmother in a photo album. She was a light-skinned woman, her hair strong and long, lightly weighed down by gravity towards her back, as she sat quietly and still, her soul probably in deep conversation with her twin sister. A photo of a cousin shown to us during this visit, revealed what appeared to be an Indian element in our family. Although the recent DNA findings would point more towards this being Creole, Taino, rather than Asian. 
Taking this into consideration the table is an illustration of how my grandmother's maternal side of the family may have come together. Statistically, seven out of eight of my great-grandmother's great-grandparents were Creole blood, having very little close contact with the majority black population of Jamaica, most who were still slaves at this time. Resulting in my great-grandmother being defined in relation to this research as a Creole woman, with an estimated birth date of around 1870. My paternal grandmother's paternal side is more from a slave background, being of Lower Guinea, Southern Nigeria, heritage. There is a dark-skinned element in this stream which may lend to the suggestion that some if not most of her father's great-grandparents were born in Africa, making them amongst the last Afrikaans to be trafficked to Jamaica for slavery. In this scenario, the newly arrived slaves from Africa were to some extent being marginalized because of their darker black skin even from amongst their fellow slaves on the plantations that they worked on in St. Mary and may have formed into their own small exclusive groups within the slave community, either because of social rejection or just by their own choice. The table illustrates the nature of the possible DNA makeup of my father's maternal grandfather's ancestral line the only name I have for him being Mr. Jackson. This obviously not being his natural African name, may have been just a name nominated for his family at the time of registration after emancipation, as a colorist way of highlighting, somewhat mockingly, their relatively recent arrival on the island and the darkness of their skin tone. Example, Black Jack, a variation on the way those of the darkest of skin complexions were being singled out which even in modern times is ridiculed in some circles in the Jamaican community. There is, however, a place in St. Mary called Jackson, making it a possibility that my great-grandfather's family was connected to that location towards the back end of the slave era. Turning to my paternal grandfather's side of the family, although he was born in the parish of St. Mary in Jamaica, his paternal side came from the parish of Manchester. His father Julius Turner would leave his home parish with his twin brother, becoming a black Baptist preacher and building a church in Glenton, St. Mary. At that time, being a preacher in a church was considered a position of great influence and privilege, indicating that he probably had a significant level of Creole blood, perhaps with recognized European elements to go with his Lower Guinea heritage which had, just half a century before, been a slave underclass. This would have given him access to willing benefactors eager to promote any venture likely to progress their objective, that being, the westernized indoctrination of the black population of Jamaica, although as a black Baptist preacher his religious expression will have differed slightly to that of his British sponsors. The table gives a picture of how this ancestral stream might have come together, going back to my four times great-grandparents. Mrs. Turner, the wife of my great-grandfather Julius, my father's paternal grandmother, to the best of my knowledge, was a woman from St. Mary. She was a woman of Lower Guinea, southern Nigeria, heritage, with some elements of Creole blood that could quite possibly have stretched back quite deep into the British era of slavery on the island of Jamaica, as depicted in the table This would be an indication that this stream of my ancestral bloodline, suffered for several generations under the brutal system of British slavery. Genetic alignments, X plus Y equals me. The gradual coming together of my great-grandparents through the generations down to my generation provides for an interesting mix of characteristics and personalities. From the Creole-centered nature of the maternal grandmother of my father to the marginalized deep black Mr. Jackson, a descendant of African slaves amongst the most recently arrived in Jamaica. Interestingly being two extremes that would come together, perhaps controversially, as the parents of my paternal grandmother Sarah in or around 1900. In between these two extremities is a mix of various black peoples and Creole combinations, such as my great-grandmother Sarah who was at least half Kenyan, or the maroon heritage of my great-grandmother Margaret Cumbry with her ancient royal roots, as well as the privileged positioning of my black Baptist preacher great-grandfather, Julius Turner. 
within this cocktail of DNA findings. The strands of ancestry that had to withstand the wounds and scars of the British multi-generational system of slavery should not be overlooked. The table demonstrates how the rest of my family ancestral line finally trails down to my generation from my great-grandparents, revealing all my grandparents, and ultimately my siblings and I, to be what could be called black with a distinct splash of Creole blood. The motto for Jamaica is out of many, one people, but looking at the findings coming from this speculative account into how my various genetic groups fit into the layout of my family, this should probably be more like out of many, a divided people. A culture of division that was refined in Jamaica during its tragic history as a slave plantation island and evident in my own ancestry. Like when the Baltic Jews of my ancestry maintained their own Baltic heritage by keeping themselves separate, even from fellow Jews of a different background. Creoles desperate to keep their offspring out of the clutches of the harshest forms of slavery, often sought only relationships with people of a similar complexion or lighter, and many free blacks were also very keen to shake off the shackles associated with their own blackness by seeking out only Creole partners to form a relationship. Even Maroons were not keen to get involved with slaves for fear that their offspring would also fall into slavery. This was an issue of contention for the Maroons of Kujo town and was in part at least, one of the causes of the Second Maroon War with the British which took place towards the end of the 18th century, after which they were exiled off the island to Nova Scotia before eventually being migrated to Britain's African colony of Freetone in modern-day Sierra Leone. There was also segregation within the slave communities of Jamaica, originally based on which individual tribal nation they were from, before turning into a colorist ideology marginalizing the more newly arrived African slaves based on their deep black skin complexion and lack of understanding of European languages and culture. After the abolition of slavery in Jamaica, the divisions that had existed on the island would start to crumble away in some ways, and greater levels of cross-cultural interactions would start to occur, although still held tightly under the domineering influence and watchful eye of the white colonial powers. The unity being built, towards the idea of a one Jamaican people, even after 60 years of independence is still an active project yet to be completed, with residual elements of prejudice of all kinds, including black against black still in existence, with those of the darkest of skin complexions the most negatively affected. The way that the DNA breaks down in my family shows that much of these issues have been to the greater extent overcome. But the fact remains that the outside influences of a world still trapped inside of the ideologies of prejudice, segregation, and colorism, can way too easily cause those who should know and do better, to slide back down into the gutter of intolerance, bad mind, and passapassa, or as they say in Akan, kasakasa. Instead, we should follow the ways of our progressive ancestors who recognized, even if to only a small degree, that all men are the same under the sun, regardless of their skin tone, cultural religious background, or their language dialect and are ultimately looked upon equally by the Almighty. So in acknowledging that our ancestors are our guiding lights showing us what we are capable of achieving, as well as our limitations, the only thing left to say is, Know thyself.